forgive me, I come with handwritten notes that I tweaked till the last minute. Um, so, in December 2016, I received a call from a father. He had heard about us uh, through his friend's child who had attended one of our gender sensitization seminars. Um, this is through the work that I do back home in India as a social activist uh, working on gender uh, rights and providing survivors of sexual abuse access to redressal agencies and justice. So I received this call. Um, father's four and a half year old child had stepped out of her home, crossed the road to go buy chocolates, and the store's relative, uh, who was there selling her chocolates, in that process managed to rape her. She came back, and by the time they reached out to me, they asked me for help. We spent the next several, several months running around from police stations to hospitals to courtrooms. In the hospital, I remember, there were stray dogs and cats just walking around. The hospital staff would call her, this child who barely came up to my knee, oh, refer to her, oh, as that raped child, can someone just like, you know, keep her aside, wait for her? We spent hours begging, screaming, fighting, demanding that hospital authorities see this child. There was a worry that her pelvis had been fractured due to the force of the assault. And even then, when we were trying to get an X-ray done, we had to fight because you're not supposed to charge survivors of sexual abuse any sort of medical legal fees by Indian law, and they were trying to charge her for that. Even that took a long process. Um, in the courtrooms, too, uh, there's a process called, you know, the identification parade, where a child, there's a lineup of the people she has to identify who the rapist is. I remember holding the child, and uh, the, 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 the person appointed by the judicial magistrate said, oh, the way she pointed out the rapist, alleged rapist at that point, was not sufficient. Now we're going to have these men walk out of the door one by one and ask her to tap the shoulder of the person who she thinks has raped her. Um, you know, I started my work fighting for human rights from a very idealistic perspective. But the more I started fighting for human rights, I got familiarized with human wrongs, how pervasive and insidious it is, how systematic and organized those actively engaging in human wrongs are, how they will bombard you and assault you with misinformation, with trolling, with threats from all fronts, to, with a very, 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 very real desire to want to break down your spirit, to attack you and assault you from all fronts, to just see how, 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 how many times will you keep showing up to demand for justice. Um, also, what I realized quickly is there are different rules of civility, of politeness, for those fighting for human rights and those engaging in human wrongs. There was an incident that happened early 2008 in Katwa, a district in Kashmir, where an eight-year-old child, 2018, forgive me, where an eight-year-old child belonging to a small ethnic tribal Muslim community had been kidnapped. It was a crime of ethnic cleansing. She was sedated for days in a temple and they gang-raped her. They kept sedating her so that she would remain alive but unconscious, and they gang-raped her. They called people, one of the rapists called his friend across state lines and told him, there's a girl we managed to rape, get here. And he, his friend crossed state lines so he could continue to rape her. There was a police officer involved who just before they took a stone and beat her to death said, let me rape her as well. And here's what happened. There was a protest taken out under the, with the Indian flag by the Hindu Ekta March in defense of the rapists. Because how dare you arrest Hindu men? How dare you uh, slander Hindutva and everything that Hinduism stands for? And how dare you speak up against a crime of ethnic cleansing committed on an eight-year-old child? There were, political party representatives from, there were political representatives from all parties who participated in this march demanding that the rape accused be released, demanding that this is a political conspiracy conducted by Pakistan and that this is to take Hinduism down. So, you know, that's why I... And through this whole process, there was not one statement that our government had released. Our Minister of Women and Child was tweeting this, asking women to submit kitchen hacks on how best we should clean our kitchen sinks from, our twi from her Twitter handle. 
still not putting out a statement to condemn the brutality that young girls were being subject to. So I was on a panel, and for those who know me, they know that politeness is not really my forte. So I vehemently called out the politicization. I vehemently rejected our government's complacency and complicity in the way they were handling this, and I demanded for accountability. I demanded for arrests. I demanded for resignations. This video went viral, and what followed was this: just threats, coordinated, specific threat from this one specific person. Detailing exactly what he would do to me, because I dared to call out fascism and I dared to demand for accountability. It kept going on. There are a lot more of these. It just kept going on daily, monthly, every few days. He would just keep sending me these. Presumably, he. The reason I say this is not for shock value, is not to, you know for sympathy or for you to understand how hard it is doing the work that I do. The reason I say this. Is because of the damn rules. Those engaging in human wrongs show no civility, show no politeness, are barbaric. But when we speak up and condemn, we're expected to do so politely. We're expected to speak up for human rights, but do so politely. We're expected to condemn human wrongs, but do so without offending the feelings of those conducting human wrongs too much, without making them too uncomfortable. And these damn rules are more so imposed on young people, on women, on people of color, on gender non-conforming people, on our Muslim community people. And again, you know, I say all of this not because this is an India-specific problem. These rules of civility, these, you know, the barbarism that women's bodies are being subject to, is happening around the world. This is panning global south to global north. And currently, we are dealing in times of failed leadership. You know, we have the climate crisis. We have the hyper-nationalist rhetoric. So I'm going to come to what have been my learnings and unlearnings working in this space. Yesterday, I attended a panel where um, the climate change activists and lawyers were talking about how it gets overwhelming, and I hear that a lot. Where do we start? It gets overwhelming. What do we do? How do we even address these issues? I hear you. And very often we all start and stop with, but we are at the mercy of political will. That's what you know. She didn't say we are at the mercy of political will, but she highlighted it. The panel. She said this is political will. Well, here's the thing: political will and politicians are renewable resources. It is incumbent upon us to hold ourselves accountable, to hold our world leaders accountable. More so when you occupy positions of power, authority, and privilege. More so because the people on the front lines currently doing the hard work are the most vulnerable, the most marginalized, the ones who have very little to lose, and yet are putting everything at risk to fight. So, if you believe you hold power, privilege, positions of authority, it is incumbent upon you to speak up and demand for better from our world leaders. There is no excuse. The second thing, you know, the rules of the game that I speak about. I don't have time anymore for feedback and criticism from those who will stand by the sidelines, who've never fought for human rights, who've never gone on the ground, who've never done the actual work, who do not have skin in the game, who've not paid the price that we do for doing the work that we do, but will stand on the sidelines and give us feedback and criticism. Or maybe you want to be more polite. Maybe you want to temper down your tone. Maybe you want to be less offensive. I don't have time and feedback. I don't have time for that. How about you sit down, talk to us, learn to be a better ally? How about you sit down, get get closer to the issues, get proximity to the people who are the most vulnerable, the most marginalized, and learn to be a better ally rather than telling us how we should engage in the rules of warfare when we are fighting against very real issues where people's lives are at stake. And also, I don't have time to be grateful anymore. I don't have time to be grateful for world leaders who don't see me in all of my humanity. I don't have time to be grateful to people holding positions of power and authority who don't see all of my humanity and treat human rights as privileges that they're going to dole out to me in candies and doses and ask me to be grateful for that. I just don't. And I say all of this because I'm not trying to, you know, be like a revolutionist and say, you know, f this, burn the system down. I realize how tough it is. Trust me, I have a therapist on call.、Um, 
But I see resilience as the root for all of this, to survive, to survive for the long term, to make sure that, you know, I don't... Um, to make sure I actually last, to, 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 to fight another day. And when I think of resilience, I think of resilience as a muscle. It's two steps forward, one step back in the work that we do, three steps forward, five steps back. But we still keep showing up. Remember the father I told you about in December 2016, who reached out because he needed help? September 2019, Finally, three years later, they got justice. I was on a call with the father, and we just cried. I say this because I just showed up periodically. They continued to show up every single day for three years. And showing up really, truly makes a difference. It's easy for me to... Not easy. I can deal with the bullshit and the trolling and the threats and all of that, knowing that when you do show up, it makes a difference. To one family, it makes a difference. Because I remember the father's words. He told me the guy who touched his daughter was a repeat offender. And had others reported him, his daughter would have been safe, and that he will be damned if he doesn't do everything in his power to make sure that not only does his daughter get access to justice, but also that this sexual offender is off the streets. And that's all I'll leave you with. You know, this is a highly sanitized room. All of us are talking about issues and trying to uh, address very real issues, which I'm grateful for. But what I will leave you with is, think of the very real world happening outside this highly sanitized room. And what can we do from these conversations that we've had? What can we pick up and what can our learnings and unlearnings be to actually make some sort of impact, because right now, the truth is we're leaving too many people behind, and we all need to do better. We are in times of crisis, and we all need to do better. So I know that, for me, having that call with the Father has been the reason why I continue to do the work that I do. And I'm grateful to have access to this platform, to be able to shed a light on these stories, because for me, those are my people, and I hope their stories live on with you, and it will have some sort of impact for you to think of how you can work with your communities and make sure that you know, we don't have to listen to more of these stories of barbarism and violence. So with that, I will um, invite Imran back on stage and try to have a Q&A session. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, so one of the things that um, I find so perplexing about India um, is that, and you know, this is, I think, something that we find in other developing economies, rapidly developing economies around the world, is that you have this rapid economic development juxtaposed with social change, like no, not enough social change, basically. Like, the, the economy is developing, but the... The, the culture and is not changing. You know, long-standing issues like the ones that you've raised today will continue to perpetuate even in the face of economic development. So my question for you is like, why do you think that is and what will it take to overcome those things? Firstly, our current economy is not developing. Uh, if it were, our government would have touted that when they won the re-election. Uh, farmer suicide rate is at an all-time high. Manufacturing is at an all-time low. INR to GDP rate is at an all-time high. Our economy but the is currently is not still, developing. It's growing at six or seven percent a year, right? Uh, no, those numbers are also being contested by okay. the person who ran the uh, uh, this, and we are not anywhere close to hitting the three billion. So, what do you economy. think? It, what do you think is really happening? I'll but, rephrase I mean, those, my question. Those fudge yeah. numbers aside, yeah. Yeah. but what I will say is. Um, listen, people often say it's the educated, uh, you know, leading this fight. It's not. You think of people, you look at reported data of people actually reporting sexual abuse. The father, I told you, comes from like a lower economic strata. The people actually fighting for justice, speaking up, demanding for better, are the people from the lowest 
economic strata and income. It's the higher economic strata that has concepts of family shame and we should keep quiet about it and all of that. So I actually don't see an exact correlation between economic standards and human right violations, right. if you may. There is correlation, of course, between education, access to quality education, sanitation and all of those th things. And also, I mean, you know, like, like I said, this is not an India-specific problem. I think one out of every seven women in France will be raped. So this is a pervasive problem happening globally. So, uh, you know, this concept of if just they were educated enough, they would stop raping their women and the children is deeply flawed. And also the concept of, you know, that uh, we need to acknowledge again that it's the lowest income of society of people who are actually leading the fight for justice and retribution. So what needs to change is us recognizing that our role as civil society is to not, like my role, when I saw her, she says, is to not, my end goal is to shut it down. I don't want us to be existing. I'm existing because of the government inefficiency. Like, no one is giving me taxpayer money to get the work done. It should, it should actually be state infrastructure and machinery that should be working. So what we need to focus on is building resilient infrastructure. No more of the death rhetoric, you know, death penalty rhetoric, which is damaging. Build resilient infrastructure. Put your money in judiciary. Put your money in, in healthcare. Make sure that, you know, you, the, you, you provide young people with compulsory sex education. Those are very real issues to ensure that we don't deal with human rights violations. Okay. You use the word resilience, yes. um, and it's actually a word my sister talks to me a lot about because um, she's a pediatrician, and she talks about you know one of the most important skills for children to have to build from a young age is resilience. How do you, you know, some of the things you shared just now are really tough. Where do you, where do you get your resilience from to to kind of continue the work that you're doing? You know, like I said, the father I was telling you about, um, there was a day he called me and he couldn't come to the courtroom. Rather, he wasn't, he wasn't in the right health condition to come to the courtroom. He had diarrhea. And he's like, ma'am, I have diarrhea. I don't think I can come. And I said, don't worry about it. We'll be there. He still showed up. He ran to the bathroom every few minutes, but he still showed up. Um, when they show up, you show up. You know, when you have proximity to people working on ground, you, you, their resilience is infectious and it demands for you to do better. And, and also you realize that if you don't do something, then like, what, what's the purpose of all of this? Like how much money are you going to make? How many, I mean, I love my fancy clothes too. And I love my jewelry too, but like it has to have some sort of purpose. And it's not easy, I know it's not easy. But the way you keep showing up is in solidarity with other people. I think speaking up, letting someone know you're there, having a therapist on call really <laughs> helps. I'm not even joking. Um, and really being there for each other. And you know, you know when I said the whole, the grateful thing, um, I don't know if you all know who Nadia Murad is. She's last year's Nobel Peace Laureate. She's an ISIS, she was an ISIS sex slave. She lost her entire family. Amal Clooney has been fighting for her case. And we were on a panel last year. No, she was not on a panel. I mean, she was on a panel at the, organized, uh, the event that I organized, Paris Peace Forum. And uh, the lady on the panel with her said, listen, we may not have pre prevented genocide with your people, but don't forget how many genocides we have prevented. The glass can be looked at as half full or half empty. So I think righteous anger also goes a long way in building resilience, making sure that, you know, you just don't settle for this kind of bullshit and realize that it has to be better because telling an ISIS sex survivor to be grateful is just unacceptable. So I think the more we have real conversations with people, you just have this righteous anger and this need to kind of see how you can play your role in addressing this. Okay. We might have time for one or two questions from the audience. Uh, Shira, you have a question. Thanks. Uh, I'm Shrina from the McKinsey Shrina. team. Um, India is a country close to my heart. I'm from there originally. Um, and, and this topic uh, has been one I've been thinking about quite a lot. Obviously, there were a lot of headlines that have come out in, in recent years. And, you know, w one thing in my mind, you know, that is evident from some of the comments even that you were getting is that there's, there's almost uh, an issue with, you know, the culture and the mentality there. There's a huge population there that just frankly don't think in the way that we do and, and almost don't even realize some of these acts are wrong. 
Um, so you know, you've spoken. To, when we say we do, I mean, are you talking about other countries? Sorry, yes. Yeah, so, you know, the people in this room, our views looking on that, okay. we, we would agree that that was a wrong thing to happen, right? Um, how, how can, you know, either the government or other organizations, you know, how can we actually get that deep within the culture? Uh, it's a country of a billion people. There are so many people there who maybe don't even have the access to education. They're gaining their values from, you know, the people around them, their family, and growing up with the same values. How can we get that, that deep and really just change the mindset um, so that these acts become less and less common and, and eventually go? Again, I want to reiterate, this is not an India-specific problem. I have friends, uh, feminists in France who get trolled viciously, who I have a friend in Vietnam whose child's life gets threatened because she fights for you know, climate change issues. I have friends in America who fight for these issues. The distinction is, you know, unlike America, the UK, in you know, Europe, resistance is not woke in our parts of the country, right? Like, you, you call me an Obama scholar. Back home, I'm called an anti-national and a terrorist. So uh, part in, in our side of the world, resistance is not woke. So I'll give you that. But in terms of how can you change it, I think people on the front lines are already doing that work. It's just a matter of amplifying their voices. It's a matter of listening to them, providing them access to platforms, and also standing in solidarity with them and speaking up continuously. Because like I said, the other side is very systematic and coordinated. They are, you know, the people who threaten, the, the biggest thing they want to do is get in your head. That's what they want to do. The, the people who engage in violence, the, what they want to do is systematically break you down. So it's about making sure you have a long-term plan. It's about continuing to hold your government accountable. And that comes, the best way that happens is in power with numbers and not making this a global south versus a global north issue because it really, really, really isn't. And the second you do that, this is where we get into trouble because then when we go into foreign spaces, especially western parts of the country, and speak up about what's happening back home, they say, see, you're defaming India. Does that make sense? And that's really not the case. So that, that whole conversation is something I take objection to, the way it gets framed. Not the way you're doing it, but just the way it gets framed of, you know, how do we help these Indian men get educated and treat their women better, have real conversations with women around you globally. This is a very real problem that we need to have with a lot of people professing to patriarchy. Yeah. Time for maybe one more question. Christopher, always a man for the question. Um, so I'm a male. <clears throat> I'm white. I sit in a position of privilege. I don't experience all of the things that you've talked about. My question is, what, is, what, what should men be doing? And what should... Um, what, 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 yes, just simply what should men be doing? And what is men's role in this? I don't want to play oppression Olympics, you know, because I, like I said, like, just the way you framed it, I'm aware of your body of work, and in no way are you not facing systematic resistance and pushback for the work that you have done. And I'm sure at some point, you know, this whole concept of showing strength um, and just toughening up is what we're expected to do or be numb. So I just want to acknowledge that I, I don't want to play oppression Olympics, especially not with you here. But <laughs> the stereotype let, let that you're referring to as what? a way, white man is uh, because I want to be respectful of your journey and you know what you've been subject to, which is unacceptable. Um, listen, don't come at us with advice of how we should behave, how we should talk, how polite we should be, how aggressive we should be. Listen to us. Ask us what our real issues is. Ask us about the discrimination we are facing in our day-to-day -day lives. Ask us, let you, because then you will realize that every time we step out of our homes, we change our clothing and our attire based on who's going to touch us, who's going to molest us, who's going to stare at us. And men don't even have to think of that. You're probably thinking of what's the deodorant and hair gel to put. You don't even think before bending down that someone may you know, look at your breast, pinch your ass. You all don't think about these things. I mean, of course, gender non-conforming people do. So have these real honest conversations with us. Ask us about the discrimination we face, the barriers we, uh, we face and are subject to, and ask us how they can help, you can help us. And the second you do, you'll find a, like a list of answers. And that's what you can do. Just start having those conversations. Don't come at us with suggestions. Listen to us and ask us how you can be a better ally. Okay. Thank you.